Welcome everyone to our Locust webinar for estate planning. We're so happy to see you guys here with us. A big thank you to Nicole for sharing her time and knowledge with us. Nicole is the owner of her own law firm, Laughlin Law, and she will be showing us how she uses Locust as an estate planner. If you guys have any questions, we will be taking them at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm going to get started. My name is Nicole Laughlin. I own Laughlin Law PA. I do estate planning and probate in Boca Raton, Florida, and I practice statewide throughout Florida. I also um, handle personal injury claims, but I'm going to focus today on the estate planning side of my practice, and estate planning and probate is really my primary practice areas. So I'm going to show you how I use Locust. Um, certainly, I don't think that I'm the most advanced Locust user. I started, um, I, I started in, at the end of December. Actually, I tried to um, strategically transition from my old practice management to Locus um, in December of uh, it, it, like between Christmas and New Year's um, to try to take advantage of the downtime um, with clients um, not really being active during that time. Um, I don't know how to turn my video off Harry, but I think my, I don't know if my screen is freezing up a little bit, but maybe if somebody can help me turn my video off so that we can just focus on my screen, that would be great. Um, so I'm going to take you through kind of how I set Locus up and what I did in the beginning. Um, one of the first things that I did was um, really narrow down my custom fields and um, set up my relationships. In my old practice management, I did not have um, relationship types. So I had a lot of custom fields and I was I, I was really over utilizing custom fields. So with Locus, I feel like it's much more efficient with the use of custom fields. And so I'm going to take you to my settings here and show you kind of what that looks like. Okay. So I go to my firm settings and I started with my, uh, my custom fields, like I said. Um, the custom fields I feel like are so important when you have intake forms and you want the intake forms to work for you. And so um, one, of, one of the things that um, I did very early on was set up my intake for forms. It was one of the very first things that I did. So the custom fields were, were crucial. And so you can see a lot of custom fields here, um, not really related to estate planning. Um, these are matter custom fields, but one of the um, awesome things about Locus is the custom groups so that you can customize um, what custom fields are gonna populate automatically based on your associated practice area. So um, I don't really have a lot in my custom groups for estate planning because I don't utilize the custom fields as much as I do relationships in estate planning, but you can see kind of how, how you can set this up. Um, I do use contact custom fields and for estate planning, um, you know, those are pretty simple, date of death or social security number. Um, if you go to relationship types, this is where um, I, I think that um, Locus kind of is a lot different from the other practice management that I use in that I can really um, break down um, different relationship types, but also I don't have to get too granular. Um, when I was using another practice management, I had to really use custom fields for everything. Um, if, I had, if I had somebody, um, let's say on a PI case, that was treating with a, a chiropractor, an orthopedist, an MRI, um, a gastroenterologist, all of these different providers, I would have to create a different custom field for all of them. And sometimes, you know, that I would have to create MRI one, two, three. Um, and, and so it would get kind of sloppy. Um, with dynamic merge fields and locus, I'm able to eliminate a lot of those um, custom fields that I, um, was using and narrow it down to something like medical provider. And so when I'm creating a template and I want it to go to a physical therapist, I don't have to actually create a whole new custom field for physical therapist. I can just select the physical therapist from drop down medical providers. 
Um, again, that's that's more of a of, of, of a PI benefit, but I think that the relationship types are crucial for estate planning in that we can um, designate beneficiaries, children, um, spouses, um, deceased spouses or deceased children. Um, you know, unfortunately in our practice area, we, we have to know all of those things in estate planning and probate. So um, I set up all of my relation types and my custom fields right before I went into building my intake forms so that when that intake form is complete, I have all of the information, my file is already set up and we're not doing a lot of legwork in terms of adding um, different contacts to the file. Um, of course, we have to do some cleanup work every now and then, but it's really nice that, especially if you have a diligent client who will really sit down and fill out that intake form, um, that you know you you get all that information up front. Another thing that I really love are tags. I tag excessively sometimes, I think, but I tag everything, um, and I and I hope to someday you know use this data. I've only been collecting data um, through Locus for four months, but I also have triggers in my workflows based on different tags. And in probate, for example, we have two types of administrations in Florida. And if I'm doing a formal or summary administration and I tag the matter, either formal or summary, um, my conditional logic will you know, split um, into two different um, uh, two different sides, and I have tasks associated with summary administration and tasks associated with formal. That's because I like to keep all of my probate in one probate pipeline, even though I have two kind of paths that a probate case can take. I also um, tag based on the family type, if it's a blended family, um, if, it's a, if it's a single person, um, minor children, adult children, the type of package that they want. All of this helps, I think, build the file, especially if you have repeat clients um, and um, it's just notes without having to take, you know, excessive notes and, and log those to the file. The tags kind of really give you a good idea of what that file looked like at the time you did the planning. I also have contact tags as well. Um, I don't think they're as um, as nifty as the as the other ones. Um, so I but I do tag contacts as well. Um, I, I have different pipelines. I set up a test pipeline today and cloned a lot of my automations to show you kind of how I do um, a, an estate planning flow in Locus. And this is the test pipeline now. So you can see um, I, I really tried to simplify how I um, set up a case. There's lots of things that, you know, happen in between draft review, signing and follow up and funding. Um, but I, I really want to keep a very broad overview of where every client is so that I know if the ball is in my court, I need to draft or if the ball is in the client court, I'm waiting for them to review or set up a review session or if I'm waiting for them to sign the documents. Um, so I'll go to my automations and I'll, I'll show you another thing. When I first set up Locus, I spent quite a bit of time coding what I felt would be essential um, forms to really get going. And for estate planning, um, because I use a drafting software, the essential documents were a client welcome letter, a contract for representation, and then a closing letter. But I have lots of other forms. I actually really enjoy coding forms. I wish I could spend more time doing it, but um, but for estate planning, it was very, very simple. Um, and actually my client welcome letter, I'm streamlining now to be more of a client welcome package that's gonna include um, setting up the client portal and instructions for that. So. I love the client portal. I would show you mine, but I think it contains client information. So but if you haven't set that up, it's really amazing. So I have uh, four main intake forms and I have one kind of practice area specific for each of my practice areas. And then I have a new client intake form that's kind of a generic form. 
And I'll kind of explain the process and then show you um, how it, my automations work. But on the new client intake form, I, I have a, an answering service that will, that new clients are routed to my answering service. And the answering service can either use my um, scheduling link to schedule an appointment. If the warm is lead enough, that's wonderful. The appointment is scheduled and we don't have to go through the prospect phase and all of the follow-up. Um, if the client is not quite warm enough for scheduling an appointment, then um, they, on their end, they call it kind of take a message. But what they're really doing is filling out my short new client intake form. And the, one of the most important pieces, email address, obviously, name and email address, but case type. And based on what they select um, on case type is going to determine what workflow triggers. And I, I'll show you my conditional logic there. Also kind of important to note that I do not use the lead form. I use single line text um, to collect the initial information here and then I map it in my workflow and I'll show you that. Um, I'll also show you my estate planning intake form. It's, it's I think as simple as I can make it, I know that there are some very advanced estate planning intake forms using a lot of conditional logic. Uh, mine is about 14 pages and each page is pretty short. I really want my clients to sit down and fill this out and answer every question. So I try not to overwhelm them, but um, it's broken down into sections. We go into the client or the person who's filling the form out, their history and background, information about their spouse or partner, um, information about children of their, uh, their spouse or domestic partner's children, not of the marriage, children of the marriage, um, uh, the client, potential clients, children, and then information about their current estate plan, what they have in place, who they want to select as a trustee if they're creating a trust. I think there's some conditional logic there. Their, um, the client's fiduciary appointments, the spouse's fiduciary appointments. And I don't have um, set up for each of these a contact form because I really don't want multiple contacts. A lot of times people, even for husband and wife or, or partners, they choose the same people over and over again. And I don't want to create, you know, 15 contacts for their sister. So I personally do not use uh, contact forms for these, these questions. I do use contact forms for, um, I think, for children. So uh, if you if you go back to one of these pages, um, I use contact forms with the add another field, which was recently added um, to get information about the children. And then I'll just go back to where I was. I have a page for distribution and beneficiaries, a page regarding assets, final disposition, their advisors. I, this page is helpful if um, it's really where I can make referrals back to my referral partners. If a client came to me unattached, they did not have a financial planner or advisor, um, I'm going to ask questions about their current financial retirement plan and whether or not it's been updated in the last two years. If they say it hasn't, I'm usually going to ask them why and see if they're happy with their current um, situation. And then anything else, they can upload documents um, or write down their questions. So, um, so that that's my estate planning intake form, and that usually goes out very early on in the lead phase. So, I'm going to show you the workflow that's attached to that short intake form. It's um, I call it new client intake form submitted, and what it's going to do is create a lead. And like I said, um, it's going to map all of that single line text to the lead information. Um, and then I have some tasks here for um, my assistant to update the lead, make sure that the correct practice area is selected because that's really 
important for um, the next stage, you know, down the pipeline, the triggers, tag the lead, um, make sure all the information is filled in correctly. I have a task to call the lead, make sure that we can assist. But immediately after that form is submitted, they're going to get a text message with a link to schedule an appointment with me. And they're also going to get an email based on the practice area. So for estate planning, it's going to generate an intake form. I don't mind sending my intake form out very early on in the lead process because I feel the more committed the client is to my process, the more likely they are to retain me. And that initial discovery call, which is what I call it, um, is less of a sales call and more of an actual initial consultation. So I can tell a lot by um, when I get to that meeting, if the client has filled out the intake form, if I'm going to have to really sell them or if I'm just going to have to talk about how we're, we're gonna help them. The approach isn't too much different, but if I can tell that it's a tire kicker, somebody who's not interested in retaining me, I can really keep it to 15 minutes and move on. So that initial email that goes out is gonna thank them for reaching out to us. If they haven't already, ask them to schedule an appointment and then attach the intake form. And then I have a, a, a little bit of a um, delay set up. I think it's one day where we send out another email saying they reached out to us yesterday, telling them a little bit about us, again, with a link to my intake form. And then I think I have two more emails in that sequence trying to get them to schedule an appointment before I... Um, at, at least I don't give up on them, but I don't keep bothering them in office. They'll be on my active campaign newsletter list. So they'll get, um, they're going to get some welcome emails from me there. And they're also going to be getting my monthly newsletter, but I'm not going to continue on with the, with this particular, um, prospect drip sequence. So the last one is, you know, after a few weeks, you know, to let them know that, um, life gets busy. We wanted to see if they want to schedule an appointment. Um, and, and basically that's the, the final communication. So all of that happens when somebody calls my office, they get my answering service and an intake form is filled out. I can't show you my actual lead pipeline, but once a client, once a potential client is moved to initial consultation, I have the same sort of uh, conditional logic set up by practice area. And I just add a task to create a file in SharePoint for, um, you know, so we can take notes. And then I resend the intake form and say, hey, do this before our meeting. Um, basically, if you fill out this intake form, our meeting is gonna be you know, less about what I do and more about what I can do specifically for you. And then I have another time delay of about a day where I send a reminder text to fill out that intake form. Um, after the meeting, I move, it, if it's the right fit, I move the potential client to a sign agreement stage. Um, and in that stage, it immediately sends out an email saying it was nice meeting them to look out for their contract, um, which will be sent to them shortly. Obviously, if it's not a good fit, they're not, I'm not going to move them to this stage. I'm just going to close the file. But I have, um, I have some steps down here based, again, on practice area to create a contract for representation, to send the contract for e-signature, and then some... Um, time delay to follow up on the contract. I notoriously forget to cancel or exit out of these conditions when somebody signs. So um, I try not to send this reminder text message too many days out because then I start to um, look like I'm not paying attention. Um, but I know that we're gonna be having some exit conditions shortly. So hopefully I won't have to, I won't have to do that too much. But my, my reminder email is just basically, hey, did you sign yet? And it's very simple. Um, and again, I'm four months into using Locus, so a lot of this that I set up, um, I'm going to be refining over time. So some of it is a little um, rough around the edges, I would say. 
Okay, so that pretty much gets me through the lead stage. Um, once somebody has signed up, I have a whole new set of um, practice area specific automations. And the first one is my estate planning matter has been created. And that automation is very task specific. There is going to be a create a document automation, but for the most part, it's, it's very task specific. So first an email is going to be sent to my assistant to check Locus for a new estate planning matter and to check the tasks. I do this because we have set up some filters in our Outlook email to filter Locus task emails so that they don't become overwhelming in the inbox. And so I, I want just a new clean email to go to the top of my assistant's um, inbox that tells, lets her know to, to check out Locus. Um, then the very next thing I do is share the matter with the client, um, the client portal, and send an invoice. Um, I do send the invoice after the contract has been signed because technically once we have an agreement, the relationship has been established and I haven't found a good way to send out my invoice in the lead stage, um, but I haven't had any issues with that. I'm primarily um, flat fee and some kind of hybrid between flat fee and contingent fee billing. So I usually take my fee up front and I don't start working until I've been paid. Um, then the next step is to create and send a client welcome letter. I'm actually revamping my client welcome letter to be a more generic document that has um, some instructions for setting up the Locus client portal um, so that clients know what to look out for in their inbox. And so that's actually going to, I'm going to delete this step and add a step further up to email the client and attach this more creative looking document. Right now, this is really a letter that introduces me again and then the process for estate planning, my process at least. Um, and that, so I have tasks to send that welcome letter, um, review the intake form, or schedule an appointment if we did not get an intake form back, um, and then draft, upload and share the draft with the client, and move the matter to the review stage. So once I move a client to review, now it's the ball is in their park. Um, my first um, autumn or my first trigger here, I guess, is the move the matter to this stage. But then I'm going to search for the client to so that that way I'm able to send emails um, to my client's name. Um, and I let them know that we've uploaded the draft to their secure client portal to check it, is specifically their summary sheets, um, the portfolio for accuracy. And then once they approve, we're gonna finalize it. Um, and I also give them a link to schedule a, a, a virtual meeting to review it. And then I have some more tasks here for us. Um, during this stage, at some point, the, the review is gonna be on the client if they wanna schedule a review. Sometimes clients review the summary sheets and say, yep, everything looks good, let's go. And we don't even have a review session. Sometimes the client takes too long to respond with anything at all. Um, and they've already paid me and I've already uploaded their draft. So what I've done recently is um, I will do a review using Dub and I will go through the entire estate plan and I'll spend about 15 minutes and then I'll send an email with the video of my review. And that actually worked great for a client who was MIA for about two months. And she saw that video, said it was wonderful, and approved everything. Um, and I just have some more tasks here. If we have a couple, we want to get our, um, our conflict waiver signed and then move the matter to mail sign. Um, my process, I think, is a little bit different because I'm primarily virtual. And I was virtual before the pandemic, but... I maintain a virtual office with a dedicated reception staff. I have office space to meet people if we need to. 
But moving forward, I don't think I'm going to be meeting people in person. And I haven't been meeting clients for signings either. So I have my pricing is tiered. I have virtual pricing and I have in-person pricing. In the last year, nobody has um, selected in-person pricing. And so moving forward, I'm going to try to figure out the best way to keep this entirely virtual. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I do that. But when I move the matter to mail sign, I again search the client. I send an email thanking them for approving the drafts, letting them know we're going to finalize it. If they selected virtual, they're going to receive their documents by USPS. And then we are happy to make an introduction to a reliable concierge notary service who will arrange to come to them and bring witnesses for the signing. Um, I actually found a wonderful mobile notary service um, that works throughout the state of Florida. It's owned by another attorney and her mom, and they have done a really awesome job. And so I don't get any you know, benefit for recommending them other than peace of mind, knowing that they're going to do a good job. Um, every document that I've checked since I've used them has been spot on. So I feel very comfortable making that introduction and the client pays their bill separately. Um, if they selected an in-person plan, then we're going to schedule um, an in-person signing at my office. And we just need to, um, I have a booking link for that. And then we confirm that there's conference room availability. Um, if applicable, I'm going to do a user activated trigger that sends an email to the client that says that um, their documents are in the mail. And that email is, is going to contain some final signing instructions to make sure that they check each and every page before witnesses and notary leave and to send me a copy um, so that I can um, check for accuracy and, and save a copy in the file. And then I also have this uh, noted doc is the company I use. I got tired of sending emails to them, um, introducing clients. So I created a user activated workflow for that. And the email goes out automatically to the owners of that company asking that they communicate with the client directly to schedule a signing ceremony. And I can show you those particular, I have a few user activated um, workflows. Um, one of them is, of course, they signed the contract, but they didn't pay. So there's an email for that. Um, the other one is the docs are in the mail and then the signing ceremony um, email. Um, I, I think that that really takes you through, I guess, up until funding. Um, the, the funding that I'm doing is recording deeds. So again, this is really task heavy. Um, it's, it's more to just alert me and my office that we have some final work to do. A lot of time it's really just following up with clients to make sure that they get us their documents and then we record deeds if applicable. I also have for every practice area, I have a closing um, uh, automation that sends out a text message to the client um, I have a little time delay there so I can cancel it in case it's a client I don't want to send this text message to, but um, for the most part, I always let them go. And it's a text message asking for a review. And I also have some tasks in here to send a closing letter, um, create the closing letter, close our SharePoint file and close the file in Locus. So that really you know, takes us to the end. I can show you um, some of these user, I, I cloned a lot of these automations, so I hope that they work in this test pipeline. But if you look at the matter in here, you have the um, workflow bot created my client welcome letter. So I just need to finalize that and upload it. And then the tasks that are created. But if I go back and move the matter to review, you can see, hopefully, hopefully it sent me the email. I didn't fill out my contact card completely, so it, it, might, it may not have. 
Um, but it should send an email to the client asking them to review um, their documents. Yes, you can see that email now. So we uploaded your draft. And then if I move it again to mail and sign, it should hopefully trigger the other email. I'll refresh it. It's, it, it takes a minute, but anyway, it should refresh the, the tasks and then hopefully you can see the other email that goes out. Thank you for approving your drafts. And so I can just keep moving it through the pipeline. I don't think the follow-up triggers anything necessarily. Um, and then again, like I can apply my user activated workflows, um, send an email to myself asking for, or text message to myself asking for a review or saying that my documents are in the mail. Yeah, I don't think that will, that might show up here. But that's pretty much it. So I am happy to answer any questions. Um, hopefully this was kind of interesting from somebody who is not an expert at coding or setting um, setting things up, just a regular person and pretty much solo practitioner. Um, hopefully you can give some perspective on what I was able to do in four months and how it's helped streamline my practice. Thank you so much, Nicole. We were so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Were there any questions? Um, it looks like we have a few in the chat. I'm trying to get to them now. But other than that, I think we are good. Let me stop recording this. Unless anyone has any questions they want to ask before I stop recording. There are some questions. Ariana. So I think Wendy's asking you like what other like softwares you zap or integrate with. Oh yes. So I have um, integrated with QuickBooks Online. Um, I have the Outlook integration and I I'm currently using Acuity. That's mainly because my subscription is good until September. Um, and also, I have so many zaps tied to Acuity and Active Campaign and Banner Season. So I use um, I Banner Season is actually Mailbox Power, and I have three um, main appointment types: virtual networking, which goes to referral partners, existing clients, and discovery calls. Um, I strategically streamlined my appointments for that reason. I have other ones, but I don't, they're more for internal use, like scheduling signing ceremonies or an in-person um, personal injury appointment if, if I need to do that. Um, but the ones that I give out are those three. And if I have a referral partner that um, signs up to meet with me virtually, then I have a, a zap that adds them to active campaign, but I also have a zap that will mail them a physical card that I designed in Canva and basically thanking them for meeting with me and kind of joining my network. Um, I also have um, something set up with mailbox power banner season that when I convert new clients, it will send them a welcome package that includes um, a card, um, that I, again, I designed in Canva and also a branded um, water bottle. And so that happens automatically um, through, you know, it's a, it's a zap that I set up from Locus to um, Banner Season or Mailbox Power. Um, so, so yeah, my Acuity link right now, I'm, I'm pretty married to it, but I have a lot of workflows that you can see for that I'm working on setting up the um, in-house scheduler. Um, trying to think what else I have integrated. I, I think that's pretty much it. I, I, my main powerhouse tech is Locus, um, Microsoft, and Acuity. Zapier is necessary for everything in ActiveCampaign. 
So someone asked you, like, I think you mentioned the SharePoint. So, so Gabra is asking, like, do you keep all your client documents in SharePoint or like in Blockers? Yeah, I, I keep only the documents that I need to upload and share with the client in Locus, and I keep a separate SharePoint file. Um, I really like SharePoint. I have different SharePoint sites for marketing, accounting, my legal team, um, operations, you know, that are, those, those sites are private. So I use Teams and SharePoint, and I, re I really like having my files there. I also think it's kind of a backup because I, I, I should be better at backing things up, but yeah, so I, so I only upload things to Locus that need to be shared with the client or that the client has shared with me. Okay, so another question is like, do you do anything to move your contacts to Outlook, from Locus to Outlook? Do I do anything to like connect them? Connect them, yes, yeah. Um, I think I might have a zap for that. I think there there might be a zap. But what I do is any, so I have active campaign. I have two lists. One is automatic. Anybody who uses one of my um, links is getting added to my newsletter campaign. Anybody who signs up for something on Facebook gets added to a different active campaign um, campaign and also my newsletter list. And Anybody who is entered into Locus as a new lead um, is added to my newsletter list. But I also have a zap that any contact that's created in Locus will go to a separate list in Active Campaign called I call it CRM. And basically, what I do on that list is go through periodically because it's not as automated and see if there's anybody who ended up on that list that should be on my newsletter list. Otherwise, if I'm creating contacts for like non-clients, I usually go through the Locus file, like after an intake form is submitted, me or my assistant will go through. And if they created contacts for like four children, I'm not going to add, <laughs> I don't want them to get on my newsletter I, I'm going to tag them as no newsletter, and then I'm going to eventually remove them from that list. So I, I also have a task, a recurring task set up for uh, when things are more in person, um, I would scan business cards into a shared folder and have my assistant um, create contacts for them and then tag them appropriately. And so those contacts were ones that I would want to be on my active campaign newsletter list. So I'm sort of getting away to, uh, from the question a little bit, but, but yes, I do connect my contacts. Um, I think I have a zap for Outlook, but I'm not as concerned with making Outlook contacts as I am with getting people on my active campaign list. Nicole, Mark asked if you've received positive feedback from clients using the client portal. I think, I think yes. Um, people like that I'm organized. And so I think people appreciate that. But I don't think I've received any comments really one way or the other. Um, I've actually had a really easy time um, training clients to use the client portal, believe it or not. Sometimes people will delete the initial emails, which is why I'm creating a, a better guide to welcome clients. But for the most part, once they're in, they use it and they kind of accept it as a better way than emailing me. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also people are asking like, do you like, do you do consulting as well? Do I what? Do you do consulting, like help other people to set this up, set the workflows and? Um, so I really enjoy it, but I don't know that I'm like as patient of a person <laughs> to be able to set it up for other people. Cause I mean, Harry, I think you can attest to this. Like I'm, I'm pretty neurotic and I set these things up and like test them and find like every detail. Um, so I don't know if I'm cut out to do that as like a side project, but I'm always, always happy to share with um, colleagues. And I have done that for a lot of people and, and people not, you know, in my jurisdiction. 
So I'm always happy to like, sh you know, share ideas and like anything that I've created, I'm, I'm pretty happy to, um, to share that with people. Like I'm, I don't have it under lock and key. So. Thank you very much. I think Luis is asking like for the intake forms, how granular information you collect, like for like retirement accounts, like life insurance, like how granular you go to collect the information? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you, I, I get kind of a broad overview and try to collect um, more information, you know, when, when I meet with the client. But I do ask what the size of the estate is roughly. So I kind of know, um, you know, I, I, I can tell from that question alone, you know, what kind of plan we're probably going to pick. Um, I ask about um, yeah, um, if they ever participated in a plan maintained by their employer. Um, have they made beneficiary designations under employer plans? Um, do they participate in a qualified plan or IRA? Do they have a safe deposit box? Uh, do they own property in a foreign country? And then, you know, this is, I'm sure there's a better way to collect this information, but this is about as granular as I get. I ask them to kind of list out, you know, what they know their state to be. And then I kind of go through um, myself with them, you know, what their, what their assets are. So, um, if anybody has any ideas for how to make that better, I'm, I'm, I'm open to amending it. But um, for now, when I set this up, I kind of set that and forgot it. And I, so I could definitely go back and refine it. Okay, I think that covers it. Thank you so much for your time, Nicole. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And if anybody wants to, um, you know, get in touch with me and ask any questions or um, just brainstorm ideas. I'm always happy to meet with anybody or um, you can email me. And I don't know if you if you have my information in the chat or um, you can- I will it. post it in the chat, yes. Awesome, cool. I'll post it all down here. Thank you so much, Nicole, for your time. Thank you.